Ah, you already said, yeah? Dear ones are night, Bante. Dear ones are Morning, Bante. Morning, Bante. Okay. Morning, Bante. All right. Uh, you have any question now? Yes, Hunter. Yeah. There is a, a question. Um, the Lord would ask. There's an echo in my room. Round up. Okay. The Lord Buddha says that mindfulness is divided into two parts, the two actions of apilapana and upaganghana complete the process of establishing mindfulness. Can you explain how this works uh, in mindfulness training in, in uh, breath meditation, meditation of breathing? Mindfulness in so the two words, that he, uh, the question is related to two actions that are called apilapana and okay. uh, uh, upaganghana. And there's words in singalese, in parentheses. Uh -huh. uh, can you please explain uh, the process of establishing mindfulness and also explain how this works in mindfulness training in breathing meditation? In breathing meditation. Okay, let me answer one question. But, uh, first, first part is uh, the Buddha, Buddha state. Mindfulness is divided into two parts. The two actions of application. Uh, apilapana and uh, upagandana. Upagan, upagan, upan, ganhana, okay. Upaganhana. Uh, complete the process of establishing mindfulness. Uh, could you please explain how this works in mindfulness training, right? There's a question. Okay. Yeah. First part is uh, first part is um, to uh, apilapada and upagana. Apilapada means unshakable. Once you establish mindfulness, it uh, remains well established. Uh, apilapada means not changing. Upagandana means approaching. I think these two terms we see uh, mostly in uh, commentaries. Uh, in suttas, uh, you don't find these two terms, but they find in uh, commentaries. 
So anyway, the meaning is the same. Uh, unshakable, well established. This is called Upatita Sati. Uh, first one. Uh, then uh, complete the, the process of establishing mindfulness is called Upaganhana. Establishing and completing. Uh, complete the establishment and to make it firm and uh, not losing. Uh, these are the two meanings of these two words. Okay? Another question. Yes, Vante. Vante, could you please explain the difference between rebirth and re-becoming? Okay. Rebirth and re-becoming are actually synonymous. There is no much difference. Although they use in two different various different places, but punabhava uh, punabhava uh, uh, that means uh, re-becoming. Uh, then puna uh, upati is rebirth. So uh, the word re-becoming, puna bhava bhava, is used in dependent origination. Upadana bhatya bhava. In that place, you can see the word bhava is used. Bhava, bhava has two aspects, Kama Bhava and Vipaka Bhava. Kama Bhava means actions, uh, domain or field of making, committing Kama. That's called Kama Bhava. Upapati Bhava means the result of that Kama in next life or life after that. Then, uh, 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 come, uh, what do you call this? Uh, 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 Kama uh, Puna Upati, that's uh, 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 Tatra Tatra Binandini. No, in Tanha. See. Re become now, well, re exist and take rebirth. Both mean the same thing, no difference. Only the the difference is in usage of words according to the contents. Okay, yes, Bhante. Uh, dear Bhante, during meditation, many concepts such as mindfulness, metta, the noble eightfold path, the four noble truths, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, sometimes have arisen in the mind. How can the practitioner let go of one's tendency to cling to concepts? Well, a uh, concept also sometimes is used uh, uh, as a part of our meditation. Uh, Conception, concept, and percept, uh, perception are uh, very important for practice. We have uh, uh, sanya or perception. There is a discourse called uh, Giri Mahananda Sutta. There are Buddha has, Buddha has given 10 perceptions. I think I have written a book called Mindfulness on Perception. Uh, there I have explained all this in detail. So you don't uh, worry about them. Take with the mindfulness of breathing or Buddha. If you, if you remember the Buddha, without any hesitation, use the qualities of the Buddha as a part of your meditation. That's called Buddha no Sati. Similarly, if you remember the Dhamma, Sangha, and so forth, uh, morality, Jaga, uh, Sila, and all these things, they are all called Anusati Bhavana, 10 ref ref reflections. And therefore, 
use one of them at that time, perhaps others will either uh, blend with this or uh, disappear. You will have only one of them. So you stay with that during that whole period of your meditation. It may be uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, even the whole hour. You stay with that. There's nothing wrong with that because they all are parts of our or subjects of our meditation. Okay? Yes, Bhante. Which fetters are overcome at the stage of stream entry? The fetters you overcome at the stage of extreme entry is three, are three. One is a, a view of self, meaning that there are people, although they may not express it out loud, uh, who think that the form is feeling, the form is self, self is in the form, uh, and the self has uh, form, form as self, and so forth, four ways of each, uh, uh, what you call, uh, category, skanda, uh, aggregate. Since we have five aggregates, if you multiply each of them with, five, with four, then you get 20 type of belief in self. That kind of belief will totally vanish from your mind when you attain the stream image. This is one fetter. And the other is uh, doubt about the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, uh, Karma, dependent origination, rebirth, and so on. If you have any doubt, all this doubt will totally vanish because Dhamma becomes 100% clear in your mind. Then the third that's the second factor. Third factor is uh, mm, doubt. <clears throat> now, uh, no, no. Third factor is uh, believing in the in following the rules and rituals, thinking that you can attain liberation by following various kind of unnecessary rules and regulations rules and rituals. Uh, there are a certain amount of rules and rituals that we follow, but we follow them not with the belief that we can attain enlightenment by following them, but just to conform to the community in order to have a unity. Uh, if you all, for instance, we pay respect to the Buddha. We all do that. Without respecting Buddha, we cannot achieve anything spiritually in our uh, uh, tradition. And therefore we pay respect to the Buddha out of total devotion, respect, we bow down and so forth. That's a ritual. Uh, even if you don't do it and uh, you just simply think of the Buddha, Buddha's quality and so forth, that's okay. But that by doing that much alone, we don't attain liberation. We know the limit of that practice and we do it. Other than that, we don't believe by doing only those things we can attain enlightenment. So giving up these three fetters, that is belief in permanent self, belief and doubt, and belief in rituals. These are the three fetters when you give up, uh, you give up when you attain the stream entry. Thank you, Bhante. Um, I have a follow-up question on this. It seems to me that the hardest factor to overcome is satkayadity, this belief in permanent self, and that if you overcome that one, then naturally your doubt would fade away because you see the truth of impermanence, and naturally the belief in adherence to rites and rituals would automatically fade away once you remove satkayaditi. Is that correct? No, no. You can remove satkayaditi, belief in permanent self, but the doubt can still remain. Hmm. So you have to overcome doubt as well. Uh, believe in permanent self and doubt are not related. Mm. These are two separate uh, fetters. 
uh, yes, then we have to overcome them separately. separately. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. Um, the next question has two parts, so I'll read them separately. The first part is, did we come into being at the same time uh, in samsara? So how do we, with respect to samsara, how do we come into being? Do we come into being at the same time um, in samsara? Say it again. Did we come? into being at the same time in samsara yeah, the existence of samsara did we come into the like or, uh, we, we coming into being yes uh, at, at the same time in samsara right right that is true you are uh, when you say you come into being you just uh, go along with samsara samsara is uh, a repetition of birth and death. Coming into being is coming into existence. Birth. So that's one part of samsara. The other part is uh, going out of samsara, uh, or going out of birth, uh, or dying and taking rebirth again. This process of rising, uh, uh, coming into being and going or uh, taking birth and passing away, taking birth and passing away, taking birth and passing away. This whole process itself is called samsara. So when you come into being, you are caught in samsara. Thank you, Bhante. The next part of the question is, does luck play any role in somebody having a right view? and right effort to get out of samsara and become enlightened faster. So is there a luck component into um, being able to um, have right view and perform right effort in order to attain liberation? A right view and right effort and right mindfulness, these three are called cardinal factors. According to Mahachattari Saga Sutta, in Majjhima Kaya, these three are cardinal factors. So when you start practicing them, you are practicing at the beginning to practice the noble eightfold path. Then is that leads to the end of samsara. So the point, what you're saying is that there is no component of luck. Like somebody, a person would be have more luck in life, be born under more lucky circumstances, and then they're able to um, get out of samsara faster by having that yeah. understanding. Yeah, if one has these three components, especially right understanding, right understanding comprises of understanding of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, selflessness, suffering, for noble root, noble, uh, no, no, noble eightfold path, dependent origination, come, rebirth, all this he understands, as the Buddha explained very clearly. That is the practice of noble eightfold path. There is no any other extra component except the steps given in the noble eightfold path the eight steps given in the Noble Age World Path. That includes everything that you need to attain liberation. I have a question. Is there a mundane right understanding and supramundane right understanding? Right. That's a good question. There is a right understanding and supramundane right understanding. Right understanding is... Uh, uh, based on uh, uh, mundane understanding, uh, that is uh, limited understanding, and uh, upadivepakka. Upadivepakka means it is, it, it, it will, uh, it will attain the uh, clinging. Uh, so right understanding, like, uh, giving dana, practice of morality and so forth, uh, the ten wholesome commas, 
when you practice them, you practice uh, right understanding. But supramundane understanding is it explained as Viveka Dishitam, Viral Dishitam, Nirodhisham, Vastag Parinami. You are totally liberating from Viraga, Viveka, and you see the Nirodha, and then end it in abandoning all defilements. Uh, Nirodha, what do you call it? Viragnisha, uh, Nirodhanisha, Vosag Parinami. It ripened in abandoning defilement. And that also arises in the noble person's mind. Ariyatitasa, Ariyasitasa, Ariyasitasa, Samangino is noble person, this right understanding arises in the noble, uh, practicing the noble, uh, what do you call it, stream and so forth in their mind. And that is the, uh, that is the ripening state of this practice. Other right understanding, mundane right understanding can bring mundane results. Supramundane right understanding can bring supramundane results. Therefore, people sometimes ask when you say middle path. I said this many times. Many people ask when we say the Buddha taught middle path. They ask me, has he taught upper middle path? Yes. The upper middle path is the supramundane middle path. Uh, lower middle path is just the middle path. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Next question. The Buddha didn't ask himself what is the truth. Instead, he asked a very specific question. Where does all this suffering come to an end? So my first question is, how did he know what was the right question to ask? And second question is, how did he know where to start looking for the answer? Uh, to ask the right question, uh, in the first place, uh, you have to ask sutame jnana, the knowledge of listening to dhamma. Chintame jnana, knowledge of thinking. Bhavana me jnana, you have to have, uh, you have to develop mindfulness, meditation. And uh, when you have this kind of jnana, you can frame right question. However, since everybody don't have these practices, these qualities, probably they all may not be able to ask right question. Even if you ask a wrong question from the right person, even though the question is wrong question, the person who is knowledgeable, understanding, even enlightened, will correct the question and answer it. That happened to the Buddha when his disciples asked, uh, who feels? The Buddha said, that's not a correct question. The correct question is, how feeling arises? Not who, but how. So Buddha corrected the question and asked the question. Similarly, people should not worry about right question. And the right answer, either if you ask the right answer, uh, look for the right answer. Right answer is in the noble eightfold path or noble truth, dependent origination. If you know this thing, you get the right answer. Uh, if you don't know this and ask somebody who knows these things, he will correct your question and answer according to them. <coughs> The next question is, as, as householders, should we take three refugees and the five precepts on our own daily and also on special occasions, the eight, the eight precepts? So I see. Yeah. That, that is true. That's true. Uh, I think I must say something about this, taking three refugees and the eight precepts. 
and uh, five precepts or eight precepts and so on, uh, on special occasion, eight precepts and so forth. Now, uh, taking refuge uh, is most meaningful if you take the refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha through understanding, through the knowledge of Dhamma. You listen to Dhamma, read the Dhamma books, discuss Dhamma, then you will be convinced that the Buddha is supremely enlightened. You have no scruple or doubt in your mind. Then you take refuge in the Buddha. You take refuge in the Dhamma. Take refuge in the Sangha. So the Buddha said, Yo Dhamma Pasati, so Mang Pasati. So one who sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha through the Dhamma. Then you take refuge uh, of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So you can do it even only once in your life and continue to sustain, maintain that, uh, that uh, undertaking. That means you know for sure that you are following the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So now, if you want to uh, renew it, you renew it every day, morning and evening. That's perfectly all right. And uh, five precepts are not introduced by the Buddha. Five precepts are in Indian society those days. Even before Buddha came into existence, there were people who abstained from killing, abstained from sexual misconduct, abstained from stealing, abstaining from lying, abstaining from taking intoxications and so forth. This uh, so Buddha incorporated into his moral ethical code. Uh, that is about the uh, uh, five precepts. But eight precepts, there are two categories of eight precepts. One is that you observe on full moon days, new moon days, occasionally, once a week, and so forth. And the other eight precept is called lifetime precept. Eight lifetime precept. Eight lifetime precept are comprised of uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood for the noble eightfold path. That anybody can observe anytime all his life or her life, uh, this eight called eight lifetime precept. Right speech, abstaining from telling lies, malicious speech, harsh speech, and gossip. Four, then abstaining from right, uh, practicing right action, abstaining from killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. Three, four, seven, and right livelihood. That then it makes eight. So these are the eight lifetime precepts that people must observe all their life, not periodically, occasionally, full moon and new moon, but entire life. Because this is a noble late for path practice. So therefore, uh, the answer to your question, I think this much, I must say this much. Thank you, Bhante. The next question is, can we share merit with heavenly beings? Well, we share marriage normally out of compassion. Uh, we, love, we share marriage with everybody. That is uh, uh, our uh, earnest wish. But whether all of them receive the marriage or not is a different question. Now, gods, or gods are enjoying sanctuary place. They don't have to think of no time to think of receiving marriage. They don't really. Human beings don't receive marriage. They, they even don't know whether somebody gives marriage to them or not. Animals don't receive marriage. Uh, ghost and goblin doesn't receive marriage. But there is only one plane of existence, which is called Paradattupa Jeevi. Paradattupa Jeevi. Para means others, Datta means given, Upajivi means living. Living on the marriage given to them by others. 
are called Paradatupa Jeevi. And they are the only ones who receive it. Yanuswami asked the Buddha, Yanuswami Brahman, uh, when somebody passes, say, what can we do? Buddha said, transfer marriage. Uh, if, they, if that person is in Paradatupa Jeevi, stay. Yanuswami asked, uh, if there is no one, any of my relatives there, then the Buddha said, some other relatives of yours can be there. Then he asked, if they are not there, some other relatives. So you can, this is, he was asking all these like um, eggs and chicken uh, questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so finally, Buddha, in order to stop him, he said, Mr. Janusoni, this sansar is so long. Beginning is indiscernible. Every living being has been our relatives, mother, father, brother, sister, husband, wife, uh, and so forth and so on. And therefore, don't believe that there is no one in that particular state. There must be somebody. Okay, that is one. Then the Buddha says, suppose, just for the sake of argument, suppose there is no one there, then you don't lose anything. You get more marriage by sharing it. So that is our Buddha. Silence is bad. So this is what we must remember when we share marriage. Okay? Thank you, Bhante. Uh, the next question is, is worshipping a stupa with Buddha's relic also considered a ritual? Yes, in Mahaparnipana Sutta, Buddha said, people can pay respect to Saririka, Paribhogika, Uddesa, uh, Dhatu. Uh, paying respect to the uh, bodily parts, like called Dhatu. Uh, Uddesa, like uh, uh, paying respect to Bodhichiya and so forth. Paribhogam is uh, respecting the Buddha's uh, arms, ball, uh, part of the hair, part of the body, and so forth. If somebody can find them and pay respect to them, Buddha said that would be a source of inspiration, arousing sadha of that person. So in that respect, they can do that. But by doing so, they cannot attain enlightenment. But this would uh, help the person to arouse faith, confidence uh, in the Buddha, uh, and therefore uh, paying respect to the shrines, pagodas, where there are Buddhas, real Buddha's relics, they would be uh, benefited by arousing their sadha. I've heard, uh, Bhante, that people that went and visited places where they are Buddha's relic, that they found an immense sense of peace. So it's um, it's even more than faith. It's like there's something really happening related uh, to that. Uh, or people that go to Kushinagar or the sacred places where the Buddha had a Parinibbana or where he was born, there's a special feeling associated with it. Can you elaborate on this? Right. Even in Mahaparinibbana Sutta, Buddha said, if somebody goes to see, see the visit, mm. the place where he was born, where he attained enlightenment, where he delivered the first sermon, and where he passed away and uh, cremated, that is uh, Buddha Gaya, Bhargulubini, Buddha Gaya, Benares and uh, uh, Kusinara. Mm. These are the four places that people visit uh, out of respect, love, sadha. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a very, very good to, you know, cleanse their mind of various uh, uh, doubt and so forth temporarily and arouse sadha, mm. the faith. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. The next question is, 
Devante, how can we help somebody with a wrong understanding to have right understanding? I think that's also a good question. When somebody has wrong understanding, we must uh, uh, talk to him and not in a harsh language, not in hurting him or her, uh, not insulting him, not belittling him or her, uh, not uh, any of this negative attitude. We must uh, use our friendship, our metta, our co co compassion, we use our own qualities to talk to them in a very friendly, gentle way. Secondly, we must have uh, knowledge of the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, particularly the qualities of the Buddha. We don't know all of them. We don't know all of them. We can bring out some of the marvelous, wonderful qualities which can which are inexhaustible. You cannot uh, put a limit uh, of the qualities of the Buddha. It is it is called a unique person, unique person. Uh, so we have to explain the how Buddha becomes a unique person. Uh, secondly, uh, the qualities of the Dhamma. You can see, you can tell anybody uh, just to watch their own mind to see the validity, the uh, the real, what you call, uh, the truth of them. That means, suppose this Buddha gave this example in uh, what do you call this uh, Kalam Sutta at the end. Suppose you get angry, even in a uh, Sanghutrika, Majjhanika, Buddha has given this example. Uh, Paharada asked the question. Suppose you get angry now, are you happy? Nobody is happy, whether you are Buddhist or Christian or Hindu or Muslim or Jew or no religion or so forth. Anybody when he gets angry, that very moment the person is miserable miserable, unhappy. So you have the cause and the results. Getting angry is the cause, results is suffering. So on the other hand, you practice metta. You are very, very, very friendly, very friendly. You can go and do anything for the other person. Uh, that time you feel very, very happy. So you can see the cause and the result right there. That is called, why I, I say this in many times, I said, come and see. Come and see. Ehi pasiko. Ehi pasiko. You don't, Buddha don't say, go and see. He said, come and see. Come and see is an invitation and not sent by the Buddha. Not somebody else sent that invitation to you. Your mind says to you, come inside. Come inside and look at you introspectively. Introspectively, you look at yourself. Be your own guide, your wisdom, your testimony to see the validity of the Dhamma. So this is how we have to tell somebody who is not believing, has a wrong understanding, misunderstanding. Okay? A mm -hmm. the You know, that will be very convincing, friendly, truthful way of, way of truthful approach. This is the way. I think, friends, <laughs> you ask many good questions, and as you normally do, we now, uh, I think, have answered enough questions, answer and uh, you are expecting to do some meditation as you do every Sunday, every Saturday. So let us do some meditation, and um, uh, let me see if I can 
find this. Uh, I don't know. Share the screen then so you click here. The comments on the bottom. When I click right here. No. And you don't have. Let us bring the slides up. We have the slides. I'm not sure. Like what we can do. Yeah, it's okay, Yeah, we it's okay. we know it. You can just read it by her. Yeah. Do you have the slides? No, no, that, that, yeah. You. Okay, friends. I think. Uh, mm, uh, you remember our. Uh, Metta recitals. As I told you yesterday, I was going to have this uh, discussion in a different location. I mean, I am there. You can see the background is different. So, uh, okay. Okay. I assume you all remember the Metta Recital, okay? Okay. Let us do some meditation, okay? We have almost uh, 23 minutes. So you may take 20 minutes. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth, May all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere, neither from anger nor ill will, will anyone will harm another. As a mother would risk her own life to protect her only child, even so towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. Let no one deceive another. Heart with boundless heart. Uh, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hate or resentment, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or whenever awake, one should develop this mindfulness. This is called divinely dwelling here. Not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision. Removing desire for sensual pleasures, one comes navigating earth into the world. Okay, with this metta thought as background, let us meditate together. And take deep breath and breathe out deeply. And breathe in again deeply. Okay. Okay. As he said, when we breathe out deeply, all air in your lungs will come out, then the lungs will have full capacity to breathe in. And then you see next time you breathe, breathe lung full of in breath, bring a lot of oxygen. We charge all the red blood cells in your lungs. They go to heart. Heart pumps to go throughout every cell in our body. 
when you breathe out slowly you build up carbon dioxide that dilate your arteries the capacity of arteries become wider and you can send more oxygen this way you are even your blood pressure lowers when you do this even for five minutes sitting in a chair breathe like this you certainly can reduce your blood pressure that is secondary benefit primary benefit is that you can notice impermanence of feeling perceptions thought and consciousness when you slowly breathe in and out that means you understand you realize experience impermanence what there is impermanence is unsatisfactory you know that very clearly what there is impermanent unsatisfactory is without self what there is impermanent unsatisfactory without self that is not i that is not mine that is not myself that means we overcome our anna man ditt greed conceit and wrong view of permanent self this is the gist of vipassana meditation absolute and necessary so try to do that for the next 20 minutes
by means of these meritorious deeds. May I never join with the foolish. May I join always with the wise until the time attain Nibbana. May the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. So too may all be from the highest realm of existence to the lowest. May all beings be in the base realms with form and perception perception be released from all suffering and attain to perfect peace. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, friends, it is the end of today's session. And I want to share my metta with everybody as normally I do. May all those who are in hospitals suffering from various diseases, may they recover very soon and return to normal life and practice Dhamma meditation and liberate themselves from samsaric suffering. May all the doctors, nurses, and hospital staff who take care of these people, risking their life, sacrificing their comfort. May they all find time to practice meditation and liberate from samsaric suffering. May those who have lost their loved ones may be grieving, may they be free from grief and try to understand the nature of Dhamma, practice meditation, I liberate from sanctuary suffering. May all those who are in various troubled spots, war zones, poverty stricken, discriminations, and so on, may they all be free from such conditions and try to find the nature of Dhamma, practice meditation, and attain liberation from sanctuary suffering. May all those who are in the northern direction, northwestern direction, northeastern direction, and eastern direction, southeastern direction, southern direction, southwestern direction, western direction, northwestern direction, up and down below, all of them in all the ten directions. Be well, happy, and peaceful. Finally, may they all attain Nibbana. Okay, friends, we have to end this session. I'm glad that you came. Thank you, Bante. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Thank you, Bante. 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 Thank you, Bante.